This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. Let me wish all of our U.S. listeners a very happy Thanksgiving, and I hope that you're enjoying some time and some food with uh, family and friends as we give thanks for this holiday season and this holiday. Actually, I want to thank each of you for coming and listening each week and for tuning into this. Some of you may be listening here on the actual day this is released, and uh, if you're not, you're probably, again, enjoying an extra slice of pumpkin pie. Uh, My favorite is pecan pie, but nevertheless, I hope you're enjoying the day, and happy Thanksgiving, and I give thanks for you guys every day for being a listener and come tuning into this podcast regularly. I also want to express my thanks for all of the friends of the Magic Word who help make this podcast possible through your financial donations and your pledges. And today I would like to make a big shout out to our newest friend of the Magic Word, Mr. Charles Cisneros. Welcome, Charles, to the Friends of the Magic Word. I appreciate your donation, just as I appreciate everyone again who comes and listens to the podcast. And if you can donate, that's always great. Uh, today, we're going to be uh, talking with a guest that uh, whose name is well known to you. But before we do, I want to also mention that we had a contest a couple of weeks ago for a couple of DVD sets that were offered by Dan Fleshman. And we have the winner's names that have been drawn, and they will be announced at the end of this podcast. And so I'm going to be fairly short in the front end of this because our guest has a lot to talk about. But I also want to say that I know that this is going to be Black Friday coming up tomorrow. Uh, it's a big thing uh, here in the U.S., I guess elsewhere then as well, and then also Cyber Monday coming up. But the important thing is, if you're going to be buying something online as opposed to going out and getting in the large crowds trying to buy something this holiday season for Cyber Monday or any time for that matter, please consider using Amazon.com and, of course, using our link at the bottom of the page of each of the pages on the blog for the Magic Word Podcast on, dot com. Down there will be a little graphic that says we're an affiliate of Amazon. Click on that. It will take you to your site and you can log in and that way that we get just a little bit of money back from each purchase that you make using Amazon. So I know you're going to use Amazon. This is the best way that you can kind of help us without actually subscribing to be a friend of the Magic Word and being a patron. So thank you guys very much for using that. Well, this week we are going to speak with someone who is part of a magical dynasty of the Wilson family. Uh, the son, one, the second son of uh, Mark and Mark Wilson and Donnie Darnell. We're going to be speaking with Greg Wilson, where he's going to be talking uh, a lot about the uh, maintaining the legacy of the magic land of Alakazam. When we were in Phoenix, Arizona, or Scottsdale, actually, a suburb there, uh, for the IBM convention earlier this summer, Greg and I sat down late at night, had a little bit of scotch, and uh, had uh, quite a lively conversation. I know that you're going to enjoy and learn a lot because he has a ton of stories and he shared a lot of them. But at some point, we just kind of had to cut that off uh, because the night was getting late and the scotch was getting low. And so we uh, uh, had a good conversation. I think that you're going to enjoy this. So please welcome my guest this week, Mr. Greg Wilson here on The Magic (laughs) World. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. And today we have a very special treat uh, with uh, someone who has been around for uh, a long time, let me say, is part of a dynasty and family. You know, there are not a lot of magic dynasties, uh, as there are other kinds of dynasties where that you have, let's say, in, um, in, in other show, parts of show business where people are in the movies or television, you know, like Kirk Douglas, and you have, you know, his son Michael Douglas and other people, you know, kind of. But as far as today, I mean, we've had magic dynasties in the 1800s, but in the 1900s on into the 2000s, few, if any, I think uh, would surpass Mark Wilson and Nani Darnell, and I have with me Mr. Greg Wilson. I'm such an honor, such an honor to have you here. Hello, Greg. Hey there. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, and so, speaking of a dynasty, then you have no children. Is that right at this point, or do you have? No, we're still practicing. Still, okay, that's right. And Mike, but your brother Mike has, uh, he has three two, kids. three. Okay. Yeah. Are any of them interested in magic? Actually, my niece Sean uh, loves doing magic, Fantastic. and at every chance she can, she jumps to get on stage. Is that right? And how old is she? 
uh, um, older than uh, teenager. Or? No, no, she's in her twenties now. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. So it's not a, a path that she is pursuing, at least as far as a career path and going into magic at this point. It, it kind of is. It could be really. Uh, yeah, wow. although both my mother and I and my brother are all trying to dissuade her from it. <laughs> You know, which is kind of funny because I understand that you had done that and then now you're doing something else, you know, trying to provide or pro, uh, work with the legacy, basically, of Alakazam. Yes. Uh, but um, a, a real quick note on my niece. Yes. Uh, I was very f- fortunate. The very first time I got to actually perform with her, uh-huh. uh, she w- w- was at Magic Live a few years back. Okay. And uh, Stan had asked us to come in and be part of the Song in Half uh, show oh, that was a great. It was one. so much fun. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I I wanted to get as many family members involved in the show as I could. Mm-hmm. So I got my brother to come in town, and he played my part. I played dad. I had another girl that had been doing uh, the train with me, so she knew the train. So she was the lead. Right. And but you had the original train from Alcazar. I had. Well, I had the second one. Okay. Uh, um, the gold train. Did, did Chip buy the first one? Chip? No, nobody has. No, I have both. Okay. Okay. Dad has both. Um, uh, Mom has both. Okay, <laughs> it's in her but name. Uh, obviously there's a, a, a third person that's needed, uh, or a second person yeah, actually right. that's needed to make the trick work, right. and Sean got to play that part. Oh, that's fine. And so I thought that was pretty neat. That yeah, secret. That nobody I've else got, knew. Nobody knew. <laughs> that's yeah. really kind of an insight. Well, there you go, folks. Yeah. You hear something kind of uh, special on the inside. My that brother is came cool. out and tickled his daughter's feet, which was kind of awkward. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> that it is funny. Um, yeah, because uh, now you uh, have uh, the lady. She's Russian. Is that right? That no. That I, was your I, first I, wife. I, yes. Okay. I, we're we're going to skip past that. No, no. That's fine. No, but someone <laughs> asked me, said, is he still married to the Russian lady? I think so. But it, no. Okay. No, yeah. It was different. That's fine. Because um, you were working then after a while with the uh, uh, Chinese acrobats yes. uh, for a while. But uh, yes. then that, how long of a period was that? Uh, I'm well, really jumping I, all over the board. Sure, here, no, no, no problem. <laughs> uh, when I when I actually separated from the the Russian lady, yeah. um, uh, who shall remain nameless, yeah. uh, we uh, I kind of went away from magic, uh, mm. and I had an opportunity to uh, uh, edit uh, more. Uh, so I focused all my life work on editing, and through the process of editing TV commercials and sales demos for the Chinese acrobats, mm-hmm. I was restructuring the show into something that was more Western and more entertaining. Right. And, uh, well, not necessarily more entertaining, but more uh, digestible for the American audience. Yeah. And uh, then the producers asked me to actually go and start directing the shows. And they found mm-hmm. out I spoke a little Chinese. Mm-hmm. So I went over to China and I worked with the troops uh, and brought them back. And then I ended up driving them across country. And uh, setting the lights, I became the lighting director. I became wow, the music director everything. Yeah. and everything. Yeah. How and many people were in the uh, crew? Oh, there was a troop of between 20 and 30, depending on which show it was. But you kind of chief cook and bottle washer doing it all. That was it, yeah. yeah. And then the second year, uh, we got another driver, so I didn't have to actually drive the bus every time. Mm-hmm. But uh, I did the first year. <laughs> Driving the bus. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was really cool. How grueling. funny is that? Yeah. We, would, uh, we had a motorhome with a uh, big one of those giant motorhomes uh-huh. with... Um, uh, a trailer behind mm-hmm. and the troop inside. And How many people were in the troop? Well, as a, you know, t- t- 20 some odd people. That was a smaller okay. troop when, okay. when I had that one. Uh, then when we had another driver, it was a bigger show. Okay. Well, that was what I was asking as far as how many yeah. people were. I didn't mean how many people were. We're in the troop. I don't want to get in trouble people... for going over capacity on the van. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, because they watch that very closely, I'm sure, in China. Yeah, <laughs> with all their transportation. Yeah, I'm sure they got that. Uh, well, that was here in the states. Yeah. Oh, 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 that's right here in the states. We were yeah, going. Yeah. We were going yeah. cross country. It was. Okay. Uh, Did you ever have a van break down? Uh, fortunately, no, no. Um, but when I was touring my Big Illusion show, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Alakaz- which I also called Alakazam, uh, mm-hmm. we had an incident. In uh, what was frightening, the road was f- covered with ice, and I was driving. I had a Ford Excursion then, a big four wheel drive, mm-hmm. and a 20 foot trailer. And uh, uh, Chris Mitchell and I were driving yeah. that. And the cast would fly, and we would drive, and then we'd pick up the cast and go do the shows. So in Lincoln, Nebraska, it was just horrible. We were going down the road. I lived in Omaha. I, I could imagine what that's like. We watched the truck slide off on the sides of the oh road. And finally, we decided, no, no, we we got to stop. Yeah. Mm hmm. And you did. We did. So before that, you really had a, something serious that was yeah. going to happen. You didn't have any tires ever fall off the axle or anything. Like oh that, yes, all the time, <laughs> constantly. We were headed down to. We were going from L.A. to Palm Springs. Okay. First time we ever had the trailer hooked up to the van, and we're going down, 
And all of a sudden, we passed a truck, and a gust of wind caught the trailer from the backside, took that trailer, sent it spinning. We ended up sideways stopping all the traffic on the 10 freeway going out to pass, uh, to uh, Palm Springs. Mm-hmm. F- after we recovered from the shock <laughs> with the entire <laughs> cast in the car, with yeah, the, in yeah, the yeah. van with us, uh, we, we got ourselves righted going down the highway, and then a few miles later, a wheel goes flying past us. <laughs> That looked like one of the trailer tires. Why don't we pull over? And the trailer was being a little wacky. Yeah. And we went over, and sure enough, the vibration from the first tailspin that we went through mm-hmm. caused the lug nuts, lug nuts to loosen. loosen. Mm-hmm. And the wheel actually cut the lug nuts off, leaving part of oh, the thread the stuck inside the... So there was no way to put a tire back on. Yeah, because the lug nut had part of the screw actually in that. Yeah. So you couldn't... Oh, my gosh. So so we limped on into the, the venue, which happened to be close enough, mm-hmm. and the show was for Firestone. So the fortuitous. executives at Firestone called up the local Firestone dealership and... Uh, Help you they, out. They got the thing fixed, and we were back on the road and off to Colorado. Wow, that's, that's a yeah. funny story. Uh, you know, and speaking about the... Um, Chinese acrobats. As I recall, it didn't Becky Blaney travel with them for a while too? That was in the beginning years of the Chinese acrobats. Yes, because okay, yeah. I remember they. She was with them. Of course, she's from Houston. Walter Blaney's yeah. daughter, and that she, uh, I had them at the uh, Six Flags, and right, and they kind of hosting the, the show. Right, she exactly. Did a great job. Yes, yeah, and so that was the beginning before you guys took it over. So or something or how well, was no, this? No, my my father actually started the Chinese acrobat tours uh, soon after we'd come back from China, uh, and developed it into a big business. Uh, and it, it, the, at the end of my father's control of the company, uh, they actually had a tent that went into fair dates, and it was a, a very successful uh, venture. Mm-hmm. And then my brother took that over. Uh, what year would that have been, Greg? Mm, I was in college still, so I wasn't really involved. Okay. So that was the uh, late 80s. Mm-hmm. What were you uh, studying? Film. Okay. Yeah, I was a film major at, at USC. U- oh, USC. Yeah. Okay. I have a minor in radio and television. Oh, good And for so you. As I, whenever that you talk about film, I mean, I'm very interested in it and the editing of yeah. it and everything. I mean, I, I'm not into it as much as what you were because that was your major and everything, but I still find that fascinating. You know, I remember reading a book that Rudy Colby had recommended about uh, something Skywalker. It was George Lucas's uh, autobiography about... Um, um, uh, his first movie, and apparently that his passion is editing. He and his wife, you know, loved to edit. So whenever they had made their first movie, American, American Graffiti, not, yeah. was that it? Yeah. Uh, that um, he'd spent a lot of time, I guess, editing that one and loved it. Have you read the book? You know which one I'm talking no, about? No, I don't. I, I look forward to it. Uh, yeah, it is, uh, I wish I remember, something Skywalker. Uh, yeah, look up George Lucas, and it's a, it's a very good read, and uh, it's something as a filmmaker that you would appreciate uh, then as well. Um, anyhow, uh, so... So she had it, and so then your brother then was handling that, Then and then you said you were in school, and then what? I kind of interrupted. Oh, certainly. And then he uh, developed it with another partner who had been a translator. Mike did. My brother yeah. did. And uh, his partner then uh, uh, developed a company, uh, another level, together, the two of them, and ended up moving to Branson. My brother lived in Branson for a while. Mm-hmm. They're still there. Uh, and that's where he took the family. Is he producing some other shows in uh, Branson? He, he is in an entirely different career now. Oh, really? Okay. He works with the IEEE, the International Electrical and Electricians in Engineering. It's three E's that involve electricity and engineering. Okay. And uh, it's an international organization that controls everything from what the USB plug shape is to what your wall outlets are and how much currency flows over the grid and everything. They they have... It's like a federal it, type of uh, association? It's like? an association, right, that uh, Not is a union. international. Okay. And it's amazing. And my brother's in, involved with the charity side of taking solar power into Africa and uh, the Himalayan mountains. So, yeah, China wasn't far enough away for him, so now he has to go to Africa. <laughs> wow. Yeah, at 60-something years old, he uh, tromps through the jungles of Africa and carries his baggage over his head as he goes through the rivers. And right. It's amazing. And he's uh, providing I, solar I'm, electricity? I'm going to go do the shows where I get a nice hotel room and stay. You know, he can go into Africa and... <laughs> Get dengue fever Brave or whatever. Malaria, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to worry about no, that. Thank you. you just have to worry about having some bad food or bad sushi or something is all <laughs> yeah. the worst thing, maybe that, uh, or whatever. Oh my gosh! Wow. Well, that sounds so great that he's providing. You know, because so, yeah. somebody really needs to do that. He's got a passion for that. Obviously, he that, just uh, not to brag, but I'm proud of my big brother. Sure. He, he was just in Ghana, mm-hmm. talking to the World Bank about financing for his projects. 
Really? At a big national World Bank convention. Because I'm sure that's something that is, is pretty expensive uh, yeah. to do. You know, I've heard of these things that are like micro loans. You've heard of them, like yeah. where some people are wanting to open a bike shop in India and we need you to give me $25, you know, yeah. or something. And, and you get like back $26 once yeah. the guy gets it. You know what I'm talking about? Exactly. This is something though, that costs a lot more, obviously, yeah. if he's going to the big banks to try to get. Uh, so I, I just it? wish he had time to help me figure out how to finance my projects. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get to that. I want to talk about that uh, definitely because that I, 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 that's why I was buying some things. I just want to support uh, what you're doing. And But going back to that, trying to preserve the history of uh, Alakazam, that, uh, and Mike was in that. Now, you were you ever in the first. This his first one was broadcast, I think, in October of 1961. In October 10th. It's so we're 60, first? First. 1960, yeah. You okay. just got your one and your zero. Okay, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> not, but not a bad memory <laughs> that comes Good. to mind. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so uh, that ran then for how many years? A total of Ten? five years. Five years. Five years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. On, uh, remember, you said three years on NBC, two on CBS? Uh, uh, yeah. ABC. Two on CBS and three, three on, on ABC. ABC. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, the reason it switched networks was because? The sponsor changed. Okay. Uh, it wasn't yeah. Kellogg's anymore. Not Kellogg's anymore. So I thought Kellogg's had them for the whole five years. Uh, well, that would have been nice. <laughs> I'm sure yeah. he would have liked that. Yeah. Uh, well, originally, though, it was Dr. Pepper when he was in Dallas. Dr. Pepper and uh, 3M. Uh, Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing. Okay. Scotch Brand Tape. Scotch Brand Tape, yeah. Uh, yeah. That was the era when there was some lawsuit about the uh, Scotch Brand Cellophane Tape, and they couldn't keep all those names. They had to give up one. So they gave up cellophane? No. I, 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 yeah, I don't know. I, so yeah. it's kind of like Kleenex. You know, the people think right. of tissues, and so they say Kleenex, but tissue is, a, is the generic name, yeah. basically, but Kleenex, became, and it's kind of like part of cellophane. So Scotch Tape is... So the, Scotch Tape is something that everybody uses as yeah. well. Yeah. Huh. Huh, okay. Well, that's interesting. Uh, so anyhow, he then, they changed after Kellogg's. Who was the next sponsor after that? Uh, uh, various sponsors. They oh, wasn't Mark's Toys, they had Mattel. Um, uh, I'm just getting into that era now. I'm discovering who all it was. Because when I watch some of these old black and white TV shows, or, you know, let's say I'm listening on Sirius XM to Radio Classics, and they play some of these old ads that are built in, you know, like when... Um, you know, uh, George Burns is uh, pitching a product or something, you know, he's talking about it in the context of a show or they're drinking that kind of Maxwell House coffee or whatever it is. You know, it's it's hard to get that branding out of uh, a show. Right. And so your dad had that Kellogg's deeply ingrained. I mean, so it was the, the K was the middle of Alakazam. As I recall also that he added an extra L so it would be symmetric and having four letters in the front and the back. Exactly. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm a nerd. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember Good you. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I loved it. If, uh, it's interesting. If you watch the shows, you'll see as they go through the season, through the first season, they shot 77 shows in the first two years. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. The majority of the shows were actually shot in the first two years. So they had to not only shoot them, but they had to come up with the magic. They had to build the props. They had oh, a- after they came up with the ideas, Leo Banky and Bev and everybody, I'm sure, were, yeah, were working on all these. Team. And yeah. Bob Fenton and Bob Towner. Okay. They were the main team. Magic makers. Yeah. And then after they would draw it out, then they had to build it and go to the shop Carl and everything. Carl Owen was building in the beginning mm-hmm. with John Daniel. Um, and then uh, after the first year, John Gon came out as a teenager. After he finished high school mm-hmm. and uh, before he went to UT, started learning, <laughs> uh, started learning from Carl Owen and assisting with the building. Yeah, and then uh, as the show went on and as expenses rose, Dad had to pull all the construction inside the company. Mm-hmm. And uh, Leo Benke's uncle, or no, his dad had a plumbing shop on Venice Boulevard, and they rented one of the other buildings in his plumbing company. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was their construction shop. And they had a Shop King multiple unit uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, tool that they could, saw okay. uh, c- to combo, cut wood and whatnot. Cutting, yeah. So, John still has that tool. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. In the plumbing shop that the plumbing he shop. was also building illusions. Right off of Venice Boulevard. Okay. So that so many stories. blows my mind about 77 shows in a year with there being 52 weeks and also having to build and practice and then shoot uh they weren't shooting live almost it was the next best thing to live um i just found as i'm going th- i'm getting deeper and deeper into the archives now mm-hmm. uh, and i'm finding paperwork that was just saved i don't know why it was saved but i'm so glad uh i found the original call sheets for the crew at CBS hmm. 
which means it shows me who was the camera operator and what was their call time yeah. and mm-hmm. what shows were they shooting on that day. So now I have production dates, not just air dates. Mm-hmm. And I always thought, as it just logically in my head, I'm thinking, okay, so they had a week. They would come up with a show. They'd shoot on the the weekend or sometime in the week, and then they'd throw it together editing-wise, and it would go on the air on Saturday, and then they'd have another week, and they'd do another show. No, they shot between two and four shows at a time. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was amazing that they were able to accumulate that much magic to be able to shoot two to four shows in one day. Holy moly. And the reason for that was... And they were half-hour shows? Half-hour shows that were that, done live. Now, that, that didn't include the... Uh, sorry, the uh, didn't have cartoons then or not? There were the cartoons, yeah. So really, as far as the magic portion and your uh, dad talking and everything, is probably no more than maybe 15 minutes? Uh, Varied between 15 and 20 minutes. 20 minutes, yeah. okay, yeah. But the magic was complicated. Especially sure the was. illusion. Especially yeah. the illusions. Um, the reason that they had to do it in such an intense manner... Uh, is because they were only paid five thousand dollars an episode for the whole kit and, and caboodle thought, and crew and everything. Yeah, Dad thought, "Wow, you know, when he was in Texas making the local shows, <laughs> that five thousand dollars, I can't spend that." Yeah, much it's high money. cotton. That's here. wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> well, it would be great. Yeah. Then he comes out to L.A. He's at CBS Television City, and the and the expenses are through the roof. Yeah. I found the because I found this paperwork now, it was ten thousand dollars plus for that one day. In the studio, not counting what the cast cost or... Uh, that's just a studio cost. Just the studio, just the union team, just the building, the lights. So that's cameras. why they tried to shoot as many as they could in the day to right. kind of capitalize on their time, I guess, yeah. so they wouldn't have to pay for an extra day and more money. Huh. And um, I, I, we're kind of jumping around here, mm-hmm. but I, I just want to help you. Yeah, because please. I found this film, which I, we debuted here at the convention, uh, that was the Alakazam um, annual report to Kellogg's and it was a it was like a madman type Mm -hmm. uh, film dad sitting on the the desk at his office with his narrow tie and his slick looking coat and he's Mm -hmm. just talking to the Kellogg's executives as a businessman yeah so it's not Mark Wilson the performer it's an entirely different person Mm -hmm. and he's explaining to them uh, why the show is successful and why uh, Kellogg's should keep investing in it and it was his plea to them to continue sponsoring the show. Mm-hmm. And it, I've heard the stories about, oh, yeah, and then Kellogg's canceled and they changed their cereal and we had to move on. And I didn't understand the depth of their attempt to stay. Mm-hmm. And this thing goes deep into the psychology of associating magic with the Kellogg's brand. Mm-hmm. And how and the kids in the show would say, Dad would come out and he'd say, Hi, you know, Magic Mind of Alakazam, where strange things happen, and blah, blah, blah. And then uh, uh, turn to the kids and say, What's the magic word? And the audience shouts, Kellogg's. Yeah. So, what they were trying to do is to ingrain into the children's minds the concept that magic and Kellogg's, Kellogg's are, are synonymous. Associated. Yes. Mm-hmm. One of the stories he tells in the film is a fan letter that he got from a magician that was with their daughter I believe or a friend a young kid crossing the street and spontaneously the little kid looked up at the street sign it's a walk don't walk timed it just right and said Kellogg's and the light changed to walk (laughs) and it said see dad I'm magic too and a a lot of magicians wrote in at the time wrote into the show saying I uh, I, we use Kellogg's as our magic word in their birthday party shows Mm mm-hmm uh, so dad but, was but not only that, they also had some film. I mean, uh, your dad said there was some sort of a camera or some technology that was developed. Yes, that's, a, that's another part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it wasn't just the business side, but also the innovations that they yeah. made. The, well, the CBS television method, the, the, the TVR system at the time, uh, incorporated videotape with film. Uh, when he was in Dallas, Texas, working for Scotch Brand Tape, mm-hmm. uh, they had a new concept of let's see if we can serialize or uh, syndicate, sorry, syndicate. syndicate or bicycle is the other term they used hmm. to carry your shows around to different stations so that you didn't have to do the show live every time at every station. Because he was for a while jumping from in the same, yeah. same day going it was station to station. Interesting. Mom just told me stories on the drive up here about uh, that you'd never heard before. That I'm, a this lot is of them I never heard before. Did you record them? Uh, no, <laughs> okay. just in my brain. Well, we are now. Yes, okay, thank so. you. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, she would read science fiction stories to my dad as he was driving to help keep him awake. Keep him awake, okay. Yeah. And sometimes mom would drive. Because they were I don't going know if from... she had a driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> but they were driving from station to station because they needed yeah. to shoot. Or city to city, city. And, and maybe the next day was the shoot or, yeah. Right. Yeah. Sometimes they would get there just in time and dad would go on camera and mom would be unpacking the car, mm -hmm. setting the props up for him as the show was happening. Hmm. Amazing. And then when dad was uh, actually in the National Guard at the time, the Air National Guard in Texas, and uh, when my brother was an infant, he had to go off to do his, his service. Mm -hmm. uh, it was during the Korean War. Uh, and mom had to do the show by herself. And mm -hmm. so dad recorded a record that was played back. Nani, now show the box empty. And uh, apparently, uh, coordinated with the voiceover gentleman at the time, mom would do all the magic on camera. It sounds kind of like the banana bandana thing, you know, where she's listening. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> she's doing it. That's funny. I think my mom doesn't get half the credit or even a third of the credit that she uh, she should for what she, she does. She was more than just an assistant in a box jumper, for Phenomenally sure. Phenomenally more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, we're having a little monkey shoulder scotch as we were talking over here. So cheers again then to you, Greg. Thanks cheers. very much. Um, <clears throat> you can start there uh, as well. Anyhow, uh, the... Um, I was just thinking about the monkey shoulders. Oh, so I was telling you about the videotape. Yes, you are. So uh, when Scotch first sent all the videotape source material, I mean the, the actual stock, to mom and dad, mm -hmm. they sent 72 reels of video, two-inch video, which are very heavy reels, mm -hmm. um, five to ten pounds. I mean, they're, yeah, more like ten pounds each. They're very heavy. Stacked. You can in only front, record how much? Like an hour or two? An hour, to, yeah. On that big thing. On okay. that giant reel. Yeah. Uh, stacked at their apartment. And they had a little apartment in Dallas, Texas. And uh, they had more videotape in their apartment than most television stations in all of Texas. Wow. Yeah. When they, because they were, <laughs> they were actually pioneering the use of videotape for broadcast. Right. I found that interesting that I'd never heard this before. Again, that I'm not a, a film student. Uh, my. Uh, um, Radio and television was really had to do with control room and editing and things like that. But, but as far as the film, I thought it interesting when you were saying that when they would uh, shoot that into the lens to record something. To, to did you, did you explain that again? The so the CBS television process, the TVR process, was the show was recorded on video on initially. Big, big, two, on two these inch, giant yeah. two inch tapes. Now this is network. This is not Dallas anymore. Now we've gone to the LA. big television city. Yeah. So Which those were expensive, as I understand. That's why there are not many copies, if any, of Johnny Carson's shows, because it was so expensive, they'd just record over those videos again. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Uh, then that tape was transferred to 35 millimeter because they had no way to physically edit the big the video. video. Yeah. There was no way to make a cut without causing a glitch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they had to switch it over to film, cut on film, which meant that everything that you saw whether it was a keyed-in graphic or a dissolve or a, a cut, it was all done live. So the show really was performed live right up until the, from the, the end of the opening titles to the first commercial break. You were talking about that also. Like, for an example, when they showed um, Huckleberry Hound and some of the cartoons, it's like you say the cut, and so they're still playing the music, but then they would come back after that little cartoon, just even in the entry uh, yeah. credits. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was, that was played live on to the videotape. Right. And then... Right with the cartoon. Transferred later to back to film. Wow. Okay. And then that 35 millimeter was cut. So, and there was no audio mixing because there was no money for that. Mm -hmm. So all the audio sound effects and everything, the music was all done live. Was what it was. Yeah. Wow. And a lot of this I didn't really realize until I got this special video that we just debuted here at the convention. Mm -hmm. On the film that I was telling you about, the annual report to Kellogg's, which was the only one that they ever made. J. Walter Thompson to, you know, to no, the ad agency? Um, um, Leo Burnett agency. Leo Burnett, sorry. Okay. J. Walter Thompson came later. Yeah, well, that was actually my major. My, my major was in advertising with a minor in radio television. So that was what nice. yeah, I knew about. <laughs> uh, so the... The um, where were we? Oh, so you're talking that was about another drink of scotch. That's, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should. Uh, that uh, you're talking about the uh, that agency uh, and 
Oh yeah, the, the cartoons and the, yeah, live, the, cartoons, uh, right, the, the right. live essence of it. So the film, the um, annual report, talks about a videotape that that was made for ten thousand dollars, where we, my dad's company, went into CBS and asked them to please take all of the television commercials that were made for Kellogg's and string them together on one reel. So they actually had to go into all the master tapes and take the the best takes of each commercial. Mm -hmm. And I found all the lists that show, uh, you know, the take number 13 or take number three or some were first takes. Um, And then assemble them onto this special reel. And he said it cost them $10,000 at that day. And today, $10,000 is worth how much? $85,000. In today's dollars. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, now that's just. They say it cost him. It cost your pop. Uh, Yeah. Wow. Now that's just. The, the translating the money that's not translating what the studio union rates would have increased to mm-hmm. so it could well have been much much more than that yeah. these days anyway that reel was something that, that rang a bell in my head and I said I think I've seen something like that and so <laughs> we found this, this film in my parents house uh, by accident Mm-hmm. I'm not. I'm not. I don't really get to go into the house very often, and <laughs> dig through mom and dad's stuff because I. They know I just won't leave. I'll just keep digging. And, uh, Greg, so you've got to go home. <laughs> yeah, please. We want to go to bed. Yeah. Um, it, it, it was late at night when I found it. Uh, so uh, we ran back to the office. My my brother happened to be visiting in town with his niece, and I really wanted to share it with them. Mm-hmm. And so we set up the projector and played it. So that night, I found this this two inch video. Yeah. The next uh, day or two later, uh, I actually went to another friend of mine who had a two-inch machine, and I took him the tape. And I was so excited because uh, how can I unlock the secrets of this tape? It's yeah. the only source I know. Right. I've been looking forever to find somebody with a two-inch machine. Holy grail. Yeah. <laughs> and he put it up. He looked at it. He said, oh, good. It's brown tape. I don't have to bake it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That means it doesn't have to sit all weekend in an oven. Oh, re- seriously. To bring bank. up the temperature, the temperature of the tape so oh. that the oxide doesn't, so the glue will hold the magnetic content onto the actual tape itself. So apparently the brown tape doesn't need that. So he threw it right up, started playing it, and I started to see this crisp, clean, incredible image. Mm-hmm. Uh, first generation. First generation. Mm-hmm. The only tape of its kind of Alakazam at all that's left. Mm-hmm. And then he stopped it and he rewound it. And he's handed it back to me and said, yep, it works. He didn't play the whole thing. He just played a few. Yep. Just teased <laughs> Enough me. to tease you. <laughs> and I said, David, please, would you please? <laughs> play a little more. I don't have any money to pay you. Yeah. Uh, could, you could you work a deal for me? And uh, so he was very nice. Um, you know, he said, you want me to play a 58-year-old tape on a 50-year-old piece of equipment with heads, the head that reads the tape, that aren't made anymore. So when these heads die, I don't have a business. So I can't do it free. Mm-hmm. I said, I, I, of course I understand. Because he was doing this for other people. That's his job. That's his job. He does yeah. the Ed Sullivan show. He does Dick Cavett. He does everything. Hmm. Uh, he's like the go-to guy for the industry. Okay. Hmm. And uh, that's why I trusted him with my tapes. Of course. So I mean, and he happened to be a friend of yours. Didn't you say that you knew from college or something? Or? Uh, I found him through other friends. Yeah. Oh, I th- okay. It was a friend of a friend. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, he, so he gave me terms to pay him back <laughs> okay. after the convention. Okay. And so I'm very happy to say that because of the love and the support of the ma- IBM and the magicians that came here today, I can pay that bill. That's fantastic. That is <laughs> yes. really good news. It's really good. <clears throat> that that means to... I can do something else later. <laughs> right. Right. And yeah. so once this is done, then you're going to put this out then on to your uh, website? There's an hour and a half of content in there. Mm-hmm. There's so many commercials. It's just amazing. Uh, so I'm going through it and I'm finding all the really cool gems. Mm-hmm. Uh, as they uh, were ending the series at uh, CBS and going to move to ABC and they'd sold new sponsors already because they had enough advanced warning Okay, yeah. Uh, that they were able to do it within one week to switch the show from one network to the next. Uh and sponsors changed, and because of reruns and whatnot, they were able to make that switch. Uh, the last week of production at CBS must have been incredibly intense. I found the document that shows the last day of the shoot, which was uh, 
June 19, 1962. Uh, that was the very last shoot date. And I happened to be performing at the Magic Castle on June 19, 2019. Okay. Which was kind of yeah. fun. Yeah, we were, yeah. well, and Mom and Dad came that night, and I mentioned it to the audience. Uh, so the 19th was their last shoot day. They shot four shows that day. Mm-hmm. So 70, whatever, through 77. Uh, then the uh, earlier in that week on the 12th, so it's just a few days earlier, they were shooting commercials for the new sponsors. Mattel and the, all the others, yeah. Yes, mm-hmm. this is Mark's Toys and Landside Games. Okay. And it was very interesting to see the difference between the Kellogg's commercials and how much fun they were having producing the Kellogg's commercials. And Dad would do fun things like, you know, the, the guy that's running the slate, he'd go, Dad would put a peanut on top of the slate so when the <laughs> slate came down and clapped, it would break the peanut. Uh, uh, they, were, they were very playful. The, the slate operator would sometimes open the slate and whack himself in the head with the <laughs> top half of it. Uh, uh, they were, uh, it was a family. Mm-hmm. It, it had a very good communal feeling. When it was, had the Kellogg's With the brand. Kellogg's. But later it became more now, serious. On that one day, that last day that they had to shoot all this stuff, yeah, it was intense. And this is the only glimpse I've had of this backstage side of the production of Alakazam. Yeah, and I've never heard my dad be angry before. And he wasn't really angry. He was he was just concerned. He wanted to get everything done. Sure. And he says, Andy, what do you want me to do? You want me to get this in one take? We haven't even rehearsed it. I don't have my bang on yet. And I, I'm asking Dad, what do you mean I don't have my bang on yet? Dad doesn't remember the phrase, but I'm going to play it again for him and see. I think they must have had a phrase, yeah, we can bang these out quickly. Uh-huh. We can knock them out quickly. Yeah, sure. And uh, so they were trying to get the commercials done quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, they didn't have the same wonderful, magical, creative inspirations that the Kellogg's ones did because they took more time to make the Kellogg's commercials. Right, yeah. And these were... Oh, we got a new toy sponsor. What are we going to do? All right. Yeah. I'll hold the cloth work. up. We'll yeah. cover the table, and you pull, swap the prop out from under the table, and we'll lower the cloth, and there's a new prop. Right. You know, simple stuff. Well, uh, and didn't you also say that, what were there, like 99 episodes, or which like one more than MASH? or was, I mean, A total of, yes, uh, more than, not MASH, but uh, Gilligan's Island. Gilligan's Island, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and the 99th episode was never aired. Do you have it uh, somewhere on video? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be Wouldn't that be fun yeah. to try and find? <laughs> yeah, I I went when when I was digging through the house that one chance I yes. had recently. Uh-huh. Right, I found the 99th episode. You haven't viewed it yet. I have it. Okay, I viewed it. It's totally different. Hmm. It was a new attempt to try and make a show for a new sponsor. I think it was the same type of concept when they were moving networks from one yeah. to the next. Dad was looking to the future. All right, now we have to modify the show. We've sure. done that one. Now what's going to be the next thing? So his hairstyle is different. The costumes are different. They're not on the Alakazam set. Uh, it was a thing that was in combination with the Boy Scouts of America, trying to find a new kind of sponsorship idea, uh, using a different kind of sponsor. And then, to the cherry part is, I found the work print. And so what happens is you have uh, your master, which is usually mm-hmm. 35 millimeter, mm-hmm. and then you'll make a 60 millimeter work print, which means the audio and the and the picture are separate uh, pieces of film. Okay. There's mag audio, and then there's the the work print, which is double sprockets, which means there's two sets of sprockets on it. Okay, there's no space for the audio track. Um, so I found a double sprocket film, and I th- and it was I knew as soon as I saw that. So this is different, and we threw it up on the projector, and it was in color. Was that the first color that he that did? That was the first color that mm-hmm. I found of of my folks, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, so it shows him in, uh, at a Boy Scout camp doing magic for the Boy Scouts. And now I can take that with the final edited version and sync up the picture and put the audio back with it because I don't have the audio. I right. just have the color picture, but I have the audio from the black and white. Did you ask him about how that was different? In other words, I was thinking about what a dramatic change that digital has made um, 
where you have a higher pixel count in the movies and on television now, you know, when actors really, you know, when they get close-ups, I mean, you can count the pores in their skin, but when it went from black and white to color, that was a fundamental shift also, and I was wondering if your dad was trying to do something different with color TV also at the time. Very much so. Yeah. Okay. Do uh, you remember the laugh-in set? Of remember course. the big laugh-in sure. wall where sure. they would pop through the windows? Yeah. And it was like a Mondrian painting where the, the colors are all in big blocks, and you've got uh -huh. the, okay. just the covered in color. Mm -hmm. So what they did with a show that I found that they shot in 1968, which came after Alakazam, mm -hmm. Alakazam in 65. So and, and Doug Henning's special came out in... So that was much later. It was later than after that? Oh, yeah, it okay. was after, well after Magic Circus, well after okay. all this other stuff, yeah. Um, the one in 68 looked like a laugh-in type show because the set was giant flats with m mottled color on them and sure. the psych with washes of color and key, uh, um, 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 what are they called, gobos? Gobos, yeah. With uh, different splashes of color. Mm-hmm. And the whole thing that Rebo's costume changed color. Um, wow. Mom's costumes were so vibrant, everything. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, speaking of Rebo, by the way, uh, Bev Bergeron had told me before about a lot of the magic that, that you guys had created that other people have had used. I remember uh, Bev talking about the elephant vanish, I think, that Siegfried and Roy had later used. Uh, that he said, yep, that was my idea. You know, and I was standing back there. I may be wrong about that story, but I'm sure he's told you some stories, you know, that I think uh, uh, probably between... Um, you know, Bev and Ricky Jay, I think that uh, everything in magic was invented between those two guys, you know, <laughs> if you talk to them, actually. But I know that there was a lot of original magic that they had to churn out all the time, and it was really good stuff, you know, all I the time. found Dad's notebook. Did you? So now I have... That could be a good book to publish eventually. I have eventually. a lot of proof now that I can... We can we can talk about later. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is really see because uh, another thing is I had talked uh, years ago with um, Cesario Pelez uh, about Le Grand David and he was saying a lot of people had taken their ideas uh, because theirs were original ideas yeah. then also uh, and he, and but he just just one of those things like you just can't chase it you got to let it go and uh, and move on and invent something else you know as I'm watching these shows and and I have to watch them very closely and I watch them multiple times because of editing them and putting them together for the website I. I watching each one sure. three to five times, if not more. Um, it's amazing to see the teamwork that it took to make the show. Mm -hmm. uh, Bev was phenomenal at uh, being that secret guy that made things happen in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, he was more than just a clown, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, much, much more. Yeah. Uh, he, you know, there's, uh, you never know when he's got an animal hanging off his back. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Some bunny or a duck or something, sure. or, yeah. or perhaps a prop is new and it's a, it's a, the, the mounts are a little tight. And so you got to whack a little harder to get things apart. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there was a, a duck bucket that happened to, have that stuck. And, and I watched Bev and he with his clown arm go, makes a big swing with his arm and comes down and whacks the top of the thing because it just wouldn't come apart yeah uh, and I guess they knew that in rehearsal and so when it was live it's just got to work right and there's so many times uh, you can see where he's working with Mark and they're looking at each other saying hope you know what's next <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of like, that's funny. Line. Yeah, right. <laughs> Trick. Hand me something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then that's my funny. mom, uh, it was just amazing how she would just make it work no matter what was needed. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, brand new illusions where the paint is literally drying. Those stories are true. You told me about that. You had mentioned that uh, the other day, I think, in your lecture. And tell that story about where your mom had rented a costume. It was a, it was a boat uh, trick where they assemble a, a toy yacht on a table and they had never had a chance to rehearse it. Mom had not really figured out how to be in it, right? And so uh, as they're performing it on camera live, they have to make it work. It's too expensive to do a second take. They can't pay that studio for more time. Right. And certainly can't have the audience watch it twice. Mm -hmm. It won't get the same reaction from the kids. So they just had to make it work. And she comes out of it, and she's wearing a cute little sailor outfit, which is not something she would normally have. So it had been a rental. Okay. And 
got some paint on it. And she was very, <laughs> very embarrassed to return it. To have to return that, yeah, with a little yeah. bit of paint that was yeah. probably nondescript and hard to see, you know, then anyhow. Now, uh, Mike was in some of the early episodes, I guess, also. Throughout was, all the... Uh, from the through, beginning, he was in there. From Dallas on through Alakazam. He was on television younger than I was. He okay. started earlier. Well, that was what I was going to talk about then next, because my son Sean is going to love this episode because he loved watching you do your manipulation you know with you with your oh, dad and, you. and way back when it's like you it's then when my son said oh you were talking to Greg Wilson because <laughs> he used to watch you uh, it wasn't that uh, magical land of Alkazam obviously because that my son is uh, 40 uh, years old so that would have been oh was it mumbo jumbo it's magic or yeah. something like that I think on That's HBO when I deb- special debuted the wakeling routine yes yeah, yeah. and you mumbo were about jumbo. how old back then 16 okay yeah, yeah. Uh, Alan uh, started teaching me uh, the that routine um, when I was about twelve or thirteen, mm-hmm. and uh, every week I would go to the office and have magic class with Alan, mm-hmm. and he would teach me in the next phase. Not each week, but you know, a, a, a bit at a time. And it took actually three years wow. before he would allow me to perform it. Mm-hmm. And he said, it "Felt like it took that long before you got it." Uh, he wanted, he see wanted to make sure and... it was. Not just that I got it, that I could, would have it for the rest of my life. Oh, okay. He said, uh, this is a piece of magic you're going to do for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. And he was right. Wow. Well, he was a brilliant guy. Um, and the book that Jim Steinmeier had done on him, I think, uh, you know. Phenomenal. It was. It was yeah. uh, one of my favorite books yeah. uh, in the library uh, there. And so you continued then and performing for a long number of years until at what point did you find this idea? I'd rather really kind of pursue the preservation of the legacy. Well, I haven't given up magic. Okay, well, I didn't oh, mean no, to imply I, that, but I, I meant... I, I love performing. Yeah. But uh, when I was doing the show at Knott's Berry Farm, it was um, uh, fortunately a, 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 a nicely paying gig. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, I didn't become wealthy, but it paid nicely. Yeah. And it allowed me to take a little break and invest money into building the website because it takes a lot of money to just get a website started Mm -hmm. there's all those startup fees and so i bought two years worth of hosting i bought two years worth of the ssl certificates and all those things Mm -hmm. the software with the continuing plans and all. i know with my podcast same thing you know that's why that i am always trying to solicit patrons to help defray these costs because (laughs) we can't do it free we would love to do it of course we would yeah we would love to just make this available for everybody yeah but um uh, my hosting is on Amazon, mm-hmm. and I use that uh, uh, for the video content because they have the best streaming service. It's the same streaming service that the studios use. Yeah. And I can protect the footage that way. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, mm-hmm. And everybody gets it really crisp, very fast, mm-hmm. uh, and it doesn't matter what kind of system you're on, uh, which took a lot of research. And so as far as the website, what is the website where people can go then right now? Alakazamarchives.com. And that's with two L's. Yes. A-L-L-A-K-A-Z-A-M. One word, no space. Yeah. Archives. A-R-C-H-I-V-E-S. Archives.com. Dot com. Not net. Okay. Yeah. Dot com. And what do you find there? Everything I can possibly put up from Alakazam. So I started with the fan mail because the fan mail is really fun. Some PDFs of uh, that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, the letters from the network and other business letters, letters from magicians. Melbourne Christopher wrote to Dad. Uh, countless people wrote to Dad. And people just wrote fan letters because you, you showed those to me earlier and you said, did oh. you ever send in a fan letter? If you did, it's probably in here someplace. And, and if any of your listeners wrote a fan letter in, please write to me, Wilson at com, and tell me and we'll look for it. I've wow. got them alphabetized. <laughs> Do you really? Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. they kept the envelopes and everything too. I think that's amazing because they must have gotten a ton of email or email letters. They did, and I've gone through a, a, a lot of them. Not everything. Sure. Um, and I have, have some wonderful volunteers mm-hmm. that come in every chance they can. And the fact that your mom and dad would actually respond to many of those letters also yeah. to have the time and everything else they were doing and yeah. rehearsing and building and uh, traveling and oh my the, goodness, the letters to my mom are really fun. Yeah, like what? Oh, have you ever done pinup pictures? Okay. Uh, okay. Have you? <laughs> okay, then. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, she was I, a very beautiful lady. Uh, you know? Do you feel the same way about me that I feel about you? Wow. Yeah, she okay. got some really uh, Odd ones. Some, big, some heavy-duty fans. Uh, yeah, well, heavy-breathing fans, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so I forget who. I, maybe it was Harry Anderson. I forget who, this, uh, who, who said it, but uh, it's a great quote. As Nani Darnell jump-started the... 
hormones of many Americans, <laughs> <laughs> many boys across America. Well, she's very leggy, you know, that yes. uh, she had the... And the complaints from the mothers oh? about how she should cover her legs. Is that right? Yes, lots okay. of those. That's interesting, too. And there's a fun letter. They did a whole cooking scene with Rebo's Bakery. Okay. And uh, it was just a themed show, the bakery and cooking. And uh-huh. So, uh, of course, they didn't add any water to the flour in the show because they didn't want to make it messy in the prop. Mm-hmm. So a child at home tried to imitate making a magic cake with flour only and without put it in the water. oven without any water, and it actually exploded oh my and caught their kitchen on fire. And she wrote in, how stupid can you people be to make a show like that? <laughs> and she was irate. It was so funny. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Some people. Watch your children closer. Boy, yes, exactly right. <laughs> and another kid wrote in, sorry to interrupt no, you. No, no, no. But he wrote in about, um, uh, I'm, I'm graduating from high school, and I'm going to do the big talent show at school, and I'm going to do the bullet catching, and there's nothing you can tell me that will stop me. And I thought, my gosh, what did they write back to this, yeah. this young man? He's going to do a bullet catch it's going to in do high a bullet school. Bullet catch in high school. This was not current day where you could, I guess. Yeah, they're different. Borrow methods. your dad's gun. Yeah, and um, dad wrote back. There is absolutely no safe way to do the bullet catching. Please, I will help you with any magic you want. Uh, but don't do that. Don't do that. I'll help. I'll, you know, I'll help you with whatever trick you want mm-hmm. to do, but not mm-hmm. that one. And so I was so curious. What happened? So I start to look back to this guy's hometown sure. newspapers yeah there was no report that's good that was good and then i looked his name up and i discovered that he became the world's foremost authority on jewish biblical coins that's odd and okay he's a highly published highly recognized uh authority of jewish biblical coins yeah so huh i guess he didn't do the bullet I, well apparently not <laughs> yeah he must have been convinced okay there is no safe way of doing yeah. it you know that uh, when you get those kinds of things it seems like they would raise a red flag and i'm talking about like any kind of a celebrity that you would get something you know that uh, there's certain types of things like i need to respond right away or maybe call 911 have somebody go and check this guy out you know before he goes and shoots up a school yeah. or something you know well that's why Nowadays. they had no no magic that did anything destructive on the show mm-hmm. that's why the train was invented as opposed to doing the song and half. that's an interesting story and i know that people People my age and others know about why that they did the train, uh, but some young people who might be listening to this may not know the story. Go ahead and tell about why they decided to do the train. Well, uh, it started back in Dallas, and Dad did a cut and restored tie uh, mm-hmm. just as a trick on one of the Dallas local shows. Yeah. And they got uh, letters that came in from mothers saying, my child has now cut all of my husband's <laughs> ties, and <laughs> you owe us a tie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, so they decided not to do anything that was harmful to another person on the show. Mm-hmm. So instead of putting swords into a, um, a Temple of Benares, uh, they created the Alakazam Castle and put wands into it. Mm-hmm. So you could have the same magic trick with a different presentation. Right, rather than sharp, pointy things that right. kids might hurt themselves so with. So the train started as Because they put a their sister in a big uh, box from the refrigerator box or something. Yeah, and chop <laughs> yeah. her up. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so uh, the train began as a stretching. Oh, didn't know that. And in order to then continue the stretching, they put a tunnel over the middle mm-hmm. and separated the, the coal car from the engine. And mom was stretched. Okay. And then once they got to the edge of where that tunnel cover was, they dropped in um, not blades, but dividers. They were obviously wooden dividers with a piece of metal in the middle to, to make the flat part. Okay. But there was a wood edge around it, so there was no sharp edge. So they dropped these two dividers in. Then they made the middle part vanish mm-hmm. by removing the tunnel. Oh, okay. And now her middle's gone. Mm-hmm. And then they separated the two halves onto the trolley trestle mm-hmm. and uh and the the top and the foot hand right and later on we just eliminated the tunnel right eliminated the stretching part because it was just too long but for many years that was the presentation huh. i didn't know about the stretching part i just thought because i recall there was something that they were trying to make it more fun because they didn't want it to look too serious and having right. blades and thinking there was going to be a bloodless kind of a cutting your sister in half kind of a thing and, and the original one they had children on stage Oh. Holding mom's hands and her feet. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. 
Now, there was not uh, like a peanut gallery in the audience, was there? In the oh, movie? yes. Okay. Live audience for every show. Okay. How many kids? I mean, like 10, 20, 100? How many? No, uh, 10 to 20 in the Dallas shows. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, 200, 300 kids. Oh, really? In, in the, the ones in, in LA? the Al shows. Huh. Yeah. And I'm very proud of my parents because diversity was just natural for them. Mm -hmm. uh, it... it, it not to tell stories outside of school, but the scotch is really good. <laughs> <laughs> it is. In, in Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. was quite different from my mother than growing up in San Diego, mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. In San Diego, in L.A., it was, you didn't really think much about diversity. It was not the same as Texas. And um, so when they first did their fair dates in Texas, when they're doing the, the, the Texas State Fair in Dallas, um, there was one day a week that, Black people were allowed to come to the fair. Okay. They weren't allowed of, except on certain of, special occasions. Quite shocking to me. I yeah. couldn't even imagine that. Of course. But right. that was just the, that era. Mm -hmm. And mom was shocked by that because it was, uh, why that? It's, yeah. You know. And so when they did Alakazam, you watch the opening of the show and you see the scan of the kids in the audience. Okay. And you'll see it's a very diverse audience. Mm -hmm. They went to all different kinds of Boy Scouts and Girl Scout troops uh, to bring in everybody. And I'm very proud of them for that. Well, that's what I was going to ask. How did they solicit the, the audience? Did the, the studio bring them in or did your mom and dad? It was a combination of the two. Okay. Um, uh, but I think a lot of the responsibility fell on my parents uh, mm -hmm. as the seasons went on. Yeah, um, I understand. Okay. Because I noticed... As the shows went on, they started to advertise, if you want tickets to come see the show, mm -hmm. uh, and that was Dad's address. It wasn't the studio address. I'm surprised they didn't have something on the Kellogg's box of saying, you know, to write in. Yeah. Since, yeah. They did they ever have any kind of magic tricks, per se, on the, the Kellogg's did. boxes? It was with... a series of ten magic tricks okay. on the Kellogg's boxes, and that's one of the articles that I've written about in, in, the, in the website. Mm -hmm. uh, I found... Uh, some Kellogg's boxes that mom and dad picked up from the factory mm -hmm. when they went to go visit the Kellogg's They haven't been glued. They weren't glued. They're beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a set that we're going to put up for, I, I need to do a fundraiser because I got I need to keep this going. I can't let it fail. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're going to do a GoFundMe or something like that. How will people find out about that? I mean, will you post that on Facebook? Or uh, everything? Fa yeah. yeah, that's the other thing I haven't done yet is I've only reached out to the limited magic community that uh, are associated with my parents and their mailing list, yeah. about 5,000 people, uh, of which um, I have currently, I'm just under 1,000 members on the website. Well, a lot of people listen to this, you know, that if somebody wants to get on the mailing list and help you out, how can oh, they get in touch with you? Please, um, even just come to watch the shows uh, at alakazamarchives.com or uh, you can write directly to me and I answer you back. Mm -hmm. I love getting mail from everybody mm -hmm. at Wilson, Wilson at alakazamarchives.com. Okay, and just ask to be put on the newsletter list and that you can uh, be... You can get on the newsletter list through the website. Okay. So there's three types, actually four types of membership. There's uh, the free membership, which mm -hmm. is open to everybody, uh, and then you'll get the newsletter. Um, and you get to watch the episode that I'm airing that week, which reminds me, i got to get an episode up tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, then uh, I have three levels of paid membership because I know not everybody can afford sure. to do a lot, so I wanted to make something simple for Affordable. people that just love the show and mm -hmm. want to help. So there's a $5 membership. And for that, you get to look at all the print material, all the stuff we scan, all the letters, um, and the other things like that, non-video related, because the video hosting is what's expensive. Um, mm -hmm. So for $15 a month, you can get access to the entire Alakazam library. Uh, that's the current plan. But you can only have access as long as your membership is... Correct. Because after you stop paying, then you can no longer go back. I mean, in other words, you can't download this. It's only streaming? Correct. We're not allowed to download. Okay. Uh, legally, I can't uh, allow downloads because of the the, uh, the content mm -hmm. and Kellogg's and all that. Right. So I have to stream it. That's my workaround mm -hmm. uh, for being able to deliver the content. Right. Uh, that it's a research. This whole project is a research. Is, legally, it's a research library. Okay. Okay. Uh, and that's why it's called the archives. Emotionally, it's a new magic community. <laughs> yes. And that's what I want to create. I want to. Uh, I discovered that Alakazam is more than just a magic word. It's more than just a TV show. It's actually an emotion. Mm -hmm. And and for me, Alakazam is the uh, uh, 
amazement and the joy and the delight that you get when you first saw a magic trick for the first time. And when you watch these shows, it brings back that emotion. It's really amazing to see how this team, this incredible team of people, uh, Bob Fenton, uh, Robert Towner, Harland, or Torchy as he was called, um, uh, Leo Benke, you mentioned he was involved with many of them, Dick Zimmerman also wrote in when he was in the Navy, when he was out at sea, he was sending in episode ideas. Um, of course, Bev John Bergeron. Gone, Bev Bergeron, of course, um, Mom and Dad, uh, and other Lynn Searles was another big part of it. Uh, how they all work together to create this thing out of love mm -hmm. and not for the dollar sign because the dollars weren't there. And the fact that they kept it alive for five years, losing money every year. Every show lost money. So they'd go out and they'd do fair dates. They'd do everything they could to make money, work in the heat and the open air, you know, and the mud out in the the fairgrounds yeah, to make some money to go back so they could go make more TV shows. Somebody told me years ago uh, that Mark Wilson has been a millionaire and bankrupt more than anyone else. You know, it's like, well... Well, maybe Ravine. I don't know. There's a good... Maybe, well, Ravine, yeah, Ravine had that, too. It's like... Yeah. Because your dad would, like, go out and make a lot of money, and then he'd put it into something, and you know, and then... I've, I found an interesting letter that he wrote to the executives at CBS. And he said, my business advisor has told me I should file bankruptcy, and that way I won't have to pay you back for all the studio time. But I intend to have a long career in the television industry, and I don't want to have that reputation. So if you could please help make a payment program for me, I will go out and make the money, and I will pay you back for the, what I owe you on these shows. Wow. Yeah. Oh, how so many people do the that? rumors that Dad went bankrupt many times is just the fact that he took the company to the point of its limit, and then he would liquidate everything from the company to help pay the bills mm -hmm. without filing bankruptcy. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. It, on a completely different subject, it, it occurred to me about you were talking about uh, your mom um, in San Diego. Where did they first meet? At a New Year's Eve party that okay. was thrown by one of Dad's fraternity brothers at University of Texas. At, at, uh, I mean at, uh, uh, SMU. SMU. Sorry. Dad was not only the head cheerleader. Yeah, I remember. But, uh, he was a overachiever. Yeah. Uh, uh, but also the head of he was the president of his fraternity, mm -hmm. and one of the fraternity brothers knew a flight attendant from American Airlines, and so they conned all the cute flight attendants to come to the, to the fraternity, party. fraternity party, sure, New Year's Eve party, and that's where they met. And mom actually came with a different date, uh -huh. met my father, and when New Year's hit, my mom and my dad kissed. This sounds like Back to the Future. It does. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. <laughs> like during the prom or something, yeah. their eyes met and they kissed. And so if you go back, you know, you change that or whatever, you know, you yeah. get in your DeLorean. Go, but <laughs> what, holy one, cow. One of the interesting things, I don't know how much time we have, but yeah. uh, um, as I'm going through this history and really digging into what really happened, not just the glory of watching the show mm -hmm. and, the, and the fun of, of the magic, and exploring the secrets and all that. Yeah. But the business side of it and how determined my father has been throughout the years, and now learning how determined my mother has been throughout the years. Uh, the, the, the perfect team. The team, yes. Uh, I get energy from performing shows. So when I uh, rehearse, that's the work. And when I do the show, that's the play. Mm -hmm. That's the way I grew up. If you don't work hard, you can't play. Mm -hmm. If you don't do your homework and study your magic, you can't go do the show with us. Mm -hmm. So I worked really hard to learn the magic so I could go out and play and be on stage. Sure. I, the selling the show wasn't part of that. So I developed a fear for selling. And I hate selling. I hate going out and trying to tell somebody how great I am and that they should buy my show. Mm -hmm. And so... Most of my sales come from somebody who's seen me do another show and they call it. Like Disney came from another show. And the Knott's Berry Farm contract came from the guy at Disney. And each of these connections has led one to another. Mm -hmm. The dominoes uh, just fallen. As opposed to my father, who's a pioneer. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, Dad, where did this pioneering spirit come from? When you married Mom and you had my brother, all of a sudden you've got a family and you're a, 
very low income family in the middle of Dallas, Texas, you're doing magic shows. Did that drive you to go out and sell more? And I've got to do a bigger show because I got to support them. He said, no, I was always that way. And then I thought back, I said, well, that's right. Because when you were in the fraternity before you met mom, you had to be the president. You had Ah, to, and then I went back even further. Well, when you were working at Douglas magic land as a demonstrator, that wasn't enough. You had to go out and do magic shows for Morton's potato chips and develop that whole marketing program. Mm -hmm. He just loves selling. He loves the challenge. He loves, and I said, well, what, what about the disappointment when they don't buy it? What happens what to that? Because for me, that's just daunting. It's like, oh, sure. man, I feel horrible. He says he blames himself for not explaining it fully. That he They just don't understand. That they just didn't understand that this was the right thing for them to do. Mm-hmm. They really should have used my idea. And so that's why he really didn't talk much about that video you were saying that because that although that was well made that annual report but they didn't renew that and so that's the so he kind of buried the tape that's the other thing is he lets things go mm-hmm. when something doesn't work he doesn't fester dwell on it yeah. and dwell yeah mm-hmm. he lets it go and I think that's a real important lesson I'm sorry I'm learning it now at this age I wish I'd learned it when I was younger <laughs> but we're going to make use of it yeah but I can share it with other people sure yeah Wow, that's uh, quite a phenomenal story. Um, Even today, Dad's 90 years old, right? Yeah. I go down to the office in Valencia, and, and I, I'm there often during the week be it with Mom and Dad. And it's the big building. That's where we have all the stuff. Sure. And I have to go through the archives. And, like, Dad, I, I, can't, I can't spend the afternoon sitting talking with you in the office. I have to go upstairs because I have volunteers that are scanning fan letters. I've got people that are helping me to to dig through stuff and move stuff in the warehouse or whatever mm-hmm. it might be. But dad's like, could you just sit with me for five minutes? I have a new idea I want to tell you about. Even at 90 years old. At 90 years old, he's got phenomenal ideas, marketing ideas for birthday party magicians to put together giant collective uh, agency that would promote birthday party magicians on the internet and yeah. ways to use modern technology for shows. And wow. I, I, like dad, I, I want to do those with you. Of course. Uh, but I've got to finish the other thing that we started two years ago. You know? <laughs> yeah, so many things. He just needs a staff of people to kind he of pick up all does. these things that, uh, that and he's dropping. And my mother dropping. is just constantly frustrated with it. Yeah. Oh, Mark, not <laughs> another idea. <laughs> he's never going to retire. <laughs> no. He's, he's going to keep moving just yeah. like a shark, you know. Yeah, keep That feeding. was really nice when they had the classes at the Magic Castle. Yeah. He was focused on. Yeah making new lessons mm-hmm. so he was constantly going through his magic books sure going through the old books that he grew up with learning mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. like the, i found the jj bobo coin book right and he said oh yeah he lived uh, you know in texas I so he was in texas a guy yeah he used to work yeah. the school shows uh, around texas they probably knew yeah, each other he knew him yeah yeah wow phenomenal well thank you very much greg i appreciate it uh this has been just uh a great look in the past and also kind of towards the future as well. And again, for people to go, they should be going to alakazamarchives.com in order to, Please, thank you. to to help out and just to uh, send you an email if they have a request or want to know something, just wilson at uh, alakazamarchives.com. Yes. Now listen, the name of my podcast is called The Magic Word, and so I always like to end by asking my guests of what is your philosophy of life? You know, what do you live by? What's important to you? What's your magic word or wow. phrase? Wow. Uh, well, it all relates back to Alakazam. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I, even when I was a kid, people would ask me, uh, why do you want to do magic? Mm-hmm. And I say, to make people happy. Mm-hmm. That's it. <laughs> make people happy. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Yeah. It is. Greg, thanks very much. It's been just nothing less than fantastic. This has been a great trip down memory lane for me and also learning a lot of insight uh, about how the brain of Mark Wilson has been think- was thinking and still is. And so uh, that's, that's phenomenal then, too. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. So for the Magic Word Podcast, that is Greg Wilson. This is Scotty out.
Wow, what a bunch of really great stories. Thank you very much, Craig. That was just a fantastic chat, and the monkey shoulder scotch wasn't bad either. But uh, I certainly enjoyed spending some time with you and you sharing those stories. And also I want to remind everybody, if they will go to alakazamarchives.com, you can find more information on what he's doing on the legacy of the Magic Land of Alakazam. See some videos, sign up, help subscribe, and help uh, fund the project and everything. Do what you can, please, to uh, help out this worthwhile project. While we were talking, by the way, one of the things that I mentioned was a book that was recommended to me by Rudy Kobe some years ago, and I couldn't remember the name of it. It is called Skywalking, The Life and Films of George Lucas by Dale Pollack. And if you go to the Magic Word podcast uh, this week's episode, there on the blog is a place where you can click on that to go to Amazon, and that way that you can purchase that book if you're interested. It's a paperback book. And that way, of course, by using the Amazon link, as we talked about earlier, you'll be helping the Magic Word since we're an affiliate of Amazon. Well, I said at the beginning that we had a couple of winners, and now I think is a good time for us to announce who those two people were. And I first of all want to thank everyone who had entered the contest, and I like to keep these open for a couple of weeks because I know it takes a while for people to kind of get around and to listen to these podcasts and digest them, and then I don't want them to feel like, oh, I just missed the contest. Well, going to keep this open whenever I do contests for at least a couple of weeks, and so now is the time for us to announce the winners. And the winners' names are... Sean Hull and Stacy Archip. Congratulations, guys. Your DVDs are in the mail, and you should be receiving them soon so you can learn a few new tricks from Dan Fleshman. And thank you, Dan, again for offering those DVDs. Well, I want to thank you again for tuning in and listening, and if you haven't subscribed to our pod letter, please do, so that way that you know about these contests and also know who's going to be coming up from week to week. And we are soon going to be going into the Christmas and Hanukkah holiday season and so that's going to start here next week and so we're going to have a surprise guest for you uh, next week eh, it may be a surprise or maybe it won't be a surprise it's a an annual guest let me just kind of leave it at that uh, and so until next week stay well get booked and remember always try to make people happy this is scotty out 